Hello, and welcome to part two of our discussion on healthcare and the ACA, another in a series of panel discussions sponsored by Indivisible South Bay. These discussions are meant to explore the many ways in which we at Indivisible South Bay are coping with, with the results of the 2016 election. My name is Eitan Fenson. I've been a tech startup engineer, entrepreneur, and executive for the past 30 years. I've also been a, uh, a dedicated activist for social justice during that period of time. Uh, to my right is Mary Crow Lucal, a PhD academic who has applied her research expertise to learning everything she can about the state of healthcare throughout the industrialized world. Uh, Marty is also the head of the Indivisible South Bay Healthcare Issue Group. Next to Marty is Anne Heinlein, who has been a pediatric nurse at major hospitals for the last 30 years. None of us, none of us has any professional political experience. We are all volunteers with a wide variety of expertise and backgrounds. In part one of this discussion, we gave specifics about concepts, talked about effects over the past seven years of the ACA, and about considerations that went into the, work, the writing of the ACA. In this, part two, we'll delve more deeply into the politics involved in the struggle to keep Americans healthy and to look forward in, in to the ways in which we can defend and improve the ACA going forward. As always, if this show makes you want to get out of your chair, join with your friends, and take action for progressive change, then we will have accomplished something. Okay, let's, go, let's get on to, to more of the meat here. The current debate in Congress about the ACA has really helped to clarify inherent differences between two camps. One side is in the business of protecting and improving the lives of Americans. It seems like the other side instead is in the business of justifying a history of votes and a continuing policy whose effect will be to make Americans less healthy and financially less secure. Uh, many things go into this, and unfortunately, there are broader uh, political impacts. Specifically, um, there is this notion that the ACA is government intrusion into the lives of individuals, that uh, uh, in true conservative um, mode, that people really need to be able to have choice, that, that they need to be able to choose whether or not they, they need or want health insurance. Of course, we talked about the individual mandate in our previous discussion, but let's explore this notion of what that means. What does it really mean when uh, a group of, of legislators whose uh, job presumably is to protect and defend the lives of Americans, uh, what does it mean when they say they should have the choice not to have health insurance? And do you have any um, specific examples of how that choice really is a Hobson's choice? It is. Um, Health care is so expensive these days. And over if you have a chronic illness, I mean, this isn't something that's going to go away in a month. You could have it for your lifetime. And I do get somewhat angry when I hear some politician saying, you know, it's sink or swim. You need to uh, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But if you're a young person in a wheelchair with cerebral palsy and a brain injury, how are you going to pull yourself up by your boost bootstraps and be able to afford insurance premiums or even get a job where you might have employer-based health care? Then you hear politicians saying, well, you know, you decided to buy a car, buy a cell phone. Well, I don't know how expensive the cars they drive, but most cars will possibly if you sold your car and it was brand new might po possibly cover an emergency room visit and you know maybe something but i don't know any surgery that's going to be covered by buying or not buying a car or selling your car or buying an iphone you maybe if you instead of buying an iphone you 
sought medical care, you might be able to get a few labs done at that price, but that's about it. So I think what, what you're saying is that uh, for many people, the choice is, do I eat or do I pay for health insurance? That's not a real choice, is it? No. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we have one uh, political party that for the last seven years has made a, a point of explicitly revoking the ACA. And of course, with uh, President Obama in office, that wasn't going to happen. Uh, what we're finding now, interestingly, is that the American people are rebelling. Uh, they're saying, wait a second, <laughs> you can't take that away from us. Uh, and in fact, uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's an interesting statement uh, about the, the writing and the development of the ACA. Uh, if you remember, during the debates on the ACA, it, uh, many people used the metaphor of making sausage, that it was really ugly. Um, you had Max Baucus being the author of health care policy. Well, it turns out that President Obama was wiser than many of us may have uh, given him credit for in the sense that providing health insurance and enabling uh, pe people to actually get health care to 20 million people uh, is not something that's easily taken away. And I think the Republicans are learning that. Um, there's, uh, there's another, um, I know, Anne, there's a little anecdote that you have that, that is particular to um, gender-related um, health care, that uh, a particular choice that, that you made at birth, uh, what is that choice? Uh, being born with a uterus, because um, back before you could stay on your parents' health care until you're 26, um, when I graduated from college um, at 23, I no longer had health insurance. And I was going into the Peace Corps a few months later, and I would be covered by the US government. But there were, was a few months I would not be covered. So Peace Corps sent me a health care policy, a health insurance policy um, that was relatively inexpensive that I could sign up for to cover those few months. And when I looked at it, the it covered me fully. The only exception was it would not cover my uterus. So I guess for 50% of the world's population, um, the, they weren't going to cover the uterus. And it, but this was back before the internet, so I couldn't go on the internet and find different policies. So I figured, well, you know, probably nothing's going to happen to my uterus in the next um, few hmm. months. So I took the policy, but it boggled my mind that insurance companies can pick certain body parts of yours of which you have no say whether or not you contain them or have them, um, that they can exclude those. But that's what health insurance companies can do. They can exclude anything they want to. Well, it's interesting. Um, the ACA has particular requirements for health insurance policies. And in fact, this is one of the areas that President Obama was um, attacked uh, and there was an element of validity to the criticism where he said that if you have a plan that you like now you can keep it uh, and it turns out that that was not true and the reason that it wasn't true is that you may have liked the plan that didn't cover your uterus mm -hmm. <laughs> the ACA doesn't allow that so you had to get a new plan these are little details that I'm afraid don't make it to the talking points of the Republicans who, who give us um, their, um, their line about individual responsibility. Um, and it, uh, it, to my mind, this is one of our biggest challenges. We at Indivisible, I think, have a lot to, uh, to feel uh, proud of in our efforts during this debate to uh, activate and wake up uh, Americans, letting their representatives know that they're not about to give up something that is so critical to their lives. There's something that was very critical as well about being insured. Bankruptcies uh, because of health care. Uh, filings have dropped about 50% by 2016. Bankruptcies were something that was one of the, the worst causes um, of people losing everything. Um, and I think perhaps, certainly, 
the Republicans in Congress um, as they kept talking about choice and responsibility um, did not realize just how important health care was to their constituents. Yeah, I, I think that um, uh, unfortunately, whether they realized it or not, uh, they have been in the business of propaganda for so long mm. um, that, that what they say is, I'm not even sure they believe it themselves. Um, that is because on the face of it, so uh, preposterous. One best example that I can think of, thinking back to the, again, the debate, in the original debate with the ACA, um, where you had uh, people who supported the Republican position saying, get the government out of my Medicare. Um, I just found that to be particularly interesting. It, uh, not only being ridiculous, it pointed out the, the real disadvantage that we as progressive have, progressives have in messaging. Um, if, if that can in fact be something that people believe enough to insist on, then we have failed in, in our messaging and we need to, to keep that in mind. There's also the question of death panels. Uh, again, a very effective um, talking point, propaganda point that the Republicans had, that somehow it was uh, um, completely uh, morally repugnant to have the government decide on what kind of end of life care one might have. Uh, the implication that is unsaid is that it's perfectly okay for Anthem Blue Cross or Aetna to make that same decision. Um, that is a, uh, uh, a distinction that unfortunately has not been made well enough uh, to the populist revolt that was the, the Trump revolution. Um, finally, uh, I think what we're seeing with, with the frustration on the part of the Republicans that they have not been able to kill the ACA, um, they are, they're, uh, as they say, hoist on their own petard. Um, they spent seven years claiming it's a no-brainer, just get rid of it. And now that they actually, it's like the dog chasing the parked car. They've, they found the parked car, now, now what do they do with it? So it's, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, anyhow, let's go, go on to the next topic. Um, all sides agree that Americans are gonna benefit, would benefit from improvements to the ACA. Marty, you've done extensive research into how other countries implement healthcare policy, many in completely different ways. What can you tell us about models for improved policy? Well, there are a lot of different possibilities. Uh, often there is a tendency to say, I don't want something like they have in England. I don't want something like they have in Canada. Not understanding that the, the possibilities are multitudinous. Um, and as we discussed, the perfect shouldn't be the enemy of the good. Right. It doesn't have to be exactly what we want, exactly what someone else wants. We can put things together. Um, for the, the three uh, best models that I found were uh, the UK, uh, the Netherlands, and Australia, and we all remember uh, the president saying to Malcolm Turnbull, you have better health care than we do, indeed. <laughs> but let's start with the UK. Um, it's a national health service. Um, it's paid for through general tax revenue as opposed to insurance premiums. Uh, the government also helps organize and operate the delivery of health care. Most hospitals, although not all, are publicly owned. Uh, many specialists, medical specialists, are government employees. Health care is centrally directed, and this is usually what people say. They don't want, oh, you have to wait forever to get what you need. Oh, possibly not. But there are other possibilities. So Australia, which has better health care than we do, um, 
It's called Medicare for All, and they use the word Medicare, uh, single payer. It is regionally administered. Um, there are joint public hospital fundings. Uh, everyone is covered under public insurance plans that are called Medicare. Um, it's funded through tax revenue. There is lesser public involvement in health care delivery than there is in the UK. Uh, supported by general tax revenue and earmarked income tax. So when you pay your income tax, a part of it goes for medical care for the entire country. And that's something that can't be taken away or used for something else. Half the population buys private health insurance to access care outside the public system. So if they want uh, an operation that is not absolutely necessary, uh, they, can ca they can pay for it. Uh, if they want certain kinds of medication, they can buy insurance for that. Um, but there is a floor, a base, that is for everyone. Now, the Netherlands is statutory health insurance with universally mandated national exchanges. Now, we have exchanges. The Netherlands does, too. This is national. So anyone anywhere in the Netherlands can buy through these exchanges. Uh, private insurers fund health services, and they're mainly financed through community-rated premiums and payroll taxes, uh, just as our FICA um, is funded by payroll tax. This health care is funded by payroll taxes. Um, all plans, like the ACA, include a standard benefit package. Covering uteruses. <laughs> um, this is important to us. Mm -hmm. Uh, subsidies are available. Adults are required to enroll in a plan or pay a fine. No choice there. Um, it's similar in that way to the ACA, but with certain bugs taken out. 1% um, of the population has not signed up for health insurance. 99% has. Herd immunity. Exactly. Exactly. So these are these these countries have better outcomes than we do. They pay less of their GDP than we do. But they're very different systems. So if we wanted to, we could look at them and say, all right, how could we make the ACA better? using these plans as models. So what, what I hear you saying is that there isn't a, a single magic bullet that, uh, that we must use. There isn't a single path that we must go down exactly. in order to improve the ACA um, or to get to nirvana of universal health care. Um, and that's an important thing to keep in mind, particularly as far as the politics are concerned. But uh, staying on, on patient-centric uh, for the moment, Again, we'll turn to our um, health care, um, <coughs> um, shall we say, professional. Um, and do you have examples of, of how um, any one of these systems might have improved the lives or improved the lives of patients that you know of? Uh, yes. Um, like these systems in the ACA, what I'm hearing from um, folks, especially, I mean, people who've worked all over the country, um, and in the emergency room and discharge from the hospital is patients are coming in with insurance now and you can um, send them to a primary care physician after and even if they don't have one you can help them find one who can then manage them so they're not always showing up in the emergency room 
with the late stages of diseases or diseases, chronic diseases that could be managed by a primary care physician um, to make the patient have a better outcome, be healthier, live a better uh, life. But one of the issues is there was a shortage of primary care physicians before the ACA, and now um, with the ACA, that's um, become even worse. Um, so it would be nice if we could make primary care more attracted, attractive to people going into medicine. Um, and then, too, I think a lot of these countries use physician assistants, nurse practitioners, and midwives. other midwives, other people that provide excellent care under a physician but aren't actually physicians. So what you're talking really is is um, expanding the model beyond what has been traditionally the health delivery model within our, our, our country. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that there is a, a lot uh, to be um, considered here. Uh, in a little bit, we're going to talk about looking forward, what can be done um, going forward. And it's going to be focused largely on what we as individuals and as groups can do. But before we get there, I'd like to talk for, um, looking forward from a policy standpoint, because that's consistent with what we're talking about now, um, and explore and talk about what our um, uh, talking points can be to our representatives, how we can advocate for policy specifically. Um, most of us know that, that particularly among progressives and uh, the left in general, there is this push for quote unquote single payer. Now, to um, uh, to be sure, there has been an effort to turn that into a little bit better messaging. Um, the Senate Bill SB 562, which was a first foray into single payer, was dubbed Healthy California, um, which sounds a lot better than single payer. But what we have is a situation where there are zealots who uh, insist that the only way forward is, forget about the ACA, we have to go to single payer. And unfortunately, that has become a litmus test for uh, many uh, in the progressive community. And I think what, Marty, some of, of what you've um, described um, is a uh, compelling case for considering being a little bit broader. Uh, many of us uh, have a notion that Medicare is single payer, that in fact, it's the government playing health insurance. Um, when in reality, it isn't quite single payer, it is very much the Medicare of Australia, uh, in the sense that um, I, I can say specifically, um, we are uh, of Medicare age, or at least I'm getting there. My wife is already there. Uh, one thing that I've learned is that, that she now has three health insurance policies. There's Medicare, which is in some sense single payer, but she also has two other policies. One, she, one is Medicare Part D for, for um, uh, prescription drugs. There's also Part B, which is expanded, as you pointed out, and um, these are, are policy, um, uh, we'll say, uh, modifications or enhancements that uh, can lead us to expanding and improving the ACA without necessarily going to something that is monolithic. Um, and uh, we'll say making uh, some on the, on the more conservative and uh, more nervous. Um, Marty, do you have any, any thoughts about that from a policy standpoint? Um, convincing the Republicans that they should uh, support basically any kind of health care is kind of beyond my ken. <laughs> but um, it is true that we can point out that even in our own country, um, in the 50 states, there are different kinds of health care we already talked a little bit about uh, Romney Care. Right. But also, in Hawaii, <clears throat> there is uh, a medical care program that began in 1975. Um, 
it was the first to require employers to provide health care benefits and it's led to some of the highest rates of coverage and best access to medical care in the country. Nearly everyone is covered. So this is a possibility as well. We can look not only across the ocean, but we can look at what we're doing in our own country. Um, the people in Hawaii seem to f think it's just fine to have, the, uh, to have their, their government and um, their employers helping them with medical care or medical insurance so they can get medical care. There is no complaining from Hawaii about it. Right. So I think that, that um, uh, what, we've, what we've seen is as the ACA has evolved since its passage in 2009 to where we are now is that uh, it's a journey and we're in the middle of the journey and we find ourselves in a situation where it's under attack and we have uh, to our credit as a society managed to protect it um, so far. But I think it's extremely important that we realize that we're not done yet, that in fact there are still threats. Um, there's one threat that um, I don't know how many people understand, but Bob Menendez, who is a senator from New Jersey, he's a Democratic senator from New Jersey who is under indictment and he's, he's uh, in a trial right now. If he were to be found guilty and removed from the Senate, then the governor of New Jersey, our wonderful Chris Christie, would uh, be free to appoint a Republican senator. So this one vote margin uh, would disappear. The important thing to remember is that there is much that is still needed to be done to protect the ACA. And as um, we have uh, seen, there are ways in which the ACA um, can and must be improved because we know we're not there yet. Marty, as you pointed out, even though our quote-unquote outcomes have improved dramatically over the last seven years, we're still far behind the, the rest of the industrialized world in our health care outcomes. Uh, and it's not an accident. It is because we are so dysfunctional as, as far as health insurance is concerned. So that, that should uh, allow us to turn to the, the last segment, the last thing that we talk about, which is what can we as groups uh, and as individuals do to promote, to promote a health care system in the United States whose objective is health for all, not wealth for some? And uh, I think uh, there's a lot to consider. So I'm going to uh, throw it open to discussion. Anne, do you want to um, start giving us some ideas, suggestions? Well. It seems like it's going to have to be a political solution, so I think people should stand up for the health care like they have, get organized, go to the town halls, call your senator, congressman, um, and let them know your need for health care. And if the ACA is working for you, this is what's working. And to join together with the other side to come up with, because nobody's saying the ACA is perfect, but to come up with a solution consult doctors, consult nurses, consult hospitals, um, insurance companies, um, because the problem with what's been going on in the AHCA, you have 12 men in a room deciding health care for 12 white men in a room deciding health care for everyone in the country. That's not how you come up with a health care policy. And there was no medical organizations or anything that supported that. And who were two of the Republican senators who joined with uh, the rest of us in protecting the ACA who got drowned out by the worship of John McCain? Who yeah, were they? Uh, two women. Um, Lisa Murkowski mm -hmm. and, and Susan Collins. And Susan Collins, Collins. Yeah. yeah. Indeed. Marty, any, any um, thoughts from you? Um, it's very hard, I think, not to get discouraged because every day some other insanity appears. Uh, but we do have to celebrate the success in protecting the ACA, whether it's perfect or not. 
Uh, it has helped a tremendous number of people. And it's, it's been proved, science has shown, uh, that it's helped a tremendous number of people. Um, so we have done a good job there. We need to keep in mind that the threat has not gone away. So I think uh, Indivisible has made a huge difference. The Indivisible Guide has made a huge difference. Um, grassroots action uh, with the Indivisible, Indivisible Guide, with, uh, with organizations um, like Sister District, um, that are trying to work on changing the composition of the House are extremely important. And it's not always the, um, it's not always the, the importance of the person at the top of the ticket, right. the senator, right. the, the congressional representative. People who are representing cities who are on the, the county, uh, county board of supervisors, school districts, anything. This is where the action needs to start. So let's, let's um, um, kind of wrap it up. It seems to me that there are several things to keep in mind. And this is a, um, uh, a, a directive, a suggestion for grassroots action. Start writing to your um, uh, letters to the editor, to any publication that, that you uh, um, are read. Uh, um, any, any publication that, that you're connected to, just keep writing to them. Soon they'll get tired of getting letters from you, and they'll say, Uncle, we'll print one. Um, and the fact that you don't live in New York, or you don't live in Chicago, you don't live in Los Angeles, write them letters. Exactly. Very possible that they will publish it. Um, and as far as where we live, uh, in the blue district, in blue districts, we can let our representatives know what our stories are. They will use those stories to, to great benefit. We can also write letters. This is one thing I did personally to Susan Collins and Elisa Murkowski, personally thanking them for putting principle ahead of party. Um, and finally, it is extremely important, as you say, Marty, for the, the Republican juggernaut to at least be stopped in the House. If that happens, when that happens, then the ACA will be off life support. And, uh, and that is a huge thing that we need to focus on. That means that we need to get involved in the elections. We need to come together as a pro progressive community, that we cannot have litmus tests that cause us to come apart. You know, Will Rogers uh, is famous for having said, uh, I'm not a member of any uh, organized political party, I'm a Democrat. It is up to us as individuals and groups to bring together the progressive community um, and to be vocal advocates for, as you pointed out, Marty, to have the perfect not be the enemy of the good. Um, it, in any event, I think that there's plenty of work ahead of us I think we have to take it seriously. Uh, we can't assume that we will continue to be successful in protecting the ACA. I think we should assume that it, we have an obligation to work with the Republicans to improve it. Anyhow, this concludes part two of our discussion in which we've talked about the policies of the ACA, the politics of the ACA, and we look forward to how to protect and improve the ACA, fulfilling a promise of true health care for all in the U.S. Thanks to you, Marty and Ann, for your insights and explanations. And thank you all for watching.